Hello, this is Free Thought Forum, a program by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. I'm Alita Ledendecker. And I'm Faithless Forrest, and we want you to know that if you don't believe in God, you're not alone. Right here in East Tennessee, you can find free-thinking atheists and agnostics. This is a show for them and for people committed to a life rooted in science and free of supernatural beliefs. On today's show, if the technology is with us, we have a call-in guest, former East Tennessee evolutionary biologist Massimo Pialucci, who will speak with us about Darwin Day. But first, we want to tell you a little bit about the sponsors of our show. The Atheist Society of Knoxville frequently has a fun meetup at a bar or eatery. Tonight's meetup is at Barley's in the Old City, starting around 5.30. Look for the silver, cop, silver jacketed copy of The God Delusion standing upright on the table. And as Matt Dillahunty of The Atheist Experience says, everyone is welcome to our happy hour for food, drink, and conversation. But if you plan to preach, proselytize, provoke, or punch, please don't. The Rationalists of East Tennessee have several regular monthly meetings. The first and third Sunday mornings of the month are usually lectures with lively roundtable discussions. The second Sunday we hold the Skeptics Book Club. On the fourth Sunday we are mixing it up, sometimes with a get-together we call a reflections meeting. It features a potluck lunch in someone's home. Sometimes we meet to play board games or similar activities. Later in the show, we will give you our websites to visit for additional details, including times and locations. But <clears throat> now it's in the news. In, in the news in Oklahoma, the ban against same-sex marriage has recently been struck down. In response, a state legislator, I guess it's Representative Mike Turner, and it says R. Edmund, I assume Edmund is the district he represents, he's talking about no longer uh, licensing marriages in Oklahoma. I don't have my script for that, I'm sorry. As reported on NewsOn6.com, he says, my constituents are willing to have that discussion about whether marriage needs to be regulated by the state at all. Seems same-sex marriage is not a, as big a threat to marriage as this self-described Christian. Undoubtedly, the Satanic Temple will step in to fill the unregulated vacancy, too. From their website, they have the following promise. Our position is that marriage is a religious sacrament and should be governed under the First Amendment's protection of religious liberty, which should prevail over states' laws. We are available to perform weddings in Michigan as well as other states that do not recognize same-sex unions. So, I guess if Mike Turner were to be paying attention, he would know that he would enable the Satanic Temple to uh, uh, operate there in Oklahoma. So I guess the representative from Oklahoma finds him himself siding with the Satanic Temple. All righty. Um, if I understand Representative Turner's proposal, it will strike down all the current language regulating marriage with the idea, I guess, of leaving it to whomever. Currently, the law gives special privileges uh, that, uh, among others, uh, to, among others, preachers, ministers, priests, rabbis, or ecclesiastical dignitaries. But if the state were to get out of the marriage management business, I guess the Oklahoma Code, which gives special privileges to preachers, ministers, priests, rabbis, or ecclesiastical dignitaries, would go too. Maybe the requirement in those same paragraphs for the person solemnizing the marriage to be 18 years of age would go, and we would have young children officiating at their previously unwed parents' wedding. I can hear it now. Daddy, you may now kiss the mommy. Oh, that's kind of sweet. <laughs> uh, we had an, a program at RET where we saw how Marjo Goatner, I think his name was, as like a four-year-old was performing weddings. Yes. And apparently that made national news. And then states around the nation um, put in the requirement for something like 18, you had to be 18 years old to conduct marriages. A good idea. So I guess this Representative Turner, he might turn back the clock on <laughs> things like that. Well, um, here we are, uh, back to our, our main program. This evening we have telephone guest Dr. Massimo Pialucci on the line. 
Professor Pilucci was a doctor doctorate in genetics from the ha, I'm sorry has a doctorate in genetics from the University of Ferrara, Italy, a PhD in evolutionary biology from the University of Connecticut, and a PhD in philosophy from the University of Tennessee. He has done postdoctoral research in evolutionary ecology at Brown University and is currently K.D. Arani Professor of Philosophy at City College and Professor of Philosophy at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. His research interests include the philosophy of biology, the relationship between science and philosophy, and the nature of pseudoscience. Professor Pilucci has been elected Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science for Fundamental Studies of Genotype by Environmental Interactions and for Public Defense of Evolutionary Biology from Pseudoscientific Attack. In the area of public outreach, Professor Pilucci has published in national magazines such as Philosophy Now and The Philosopher's Magazine, among others. He is a fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry and a contributing editor to the Skeptical Inquirer. Pilucci edits the Scientis Scientitia Salon web magazine that's found at scientitiasalon.org and co-hosts the Rationally Speaking podcast found at rationallyspeakingpodcast.org. Professor Pilucci has published over 135 technical papers in science and philosophy. He is also the author or editor of 10 technical and public outreach books, most recently, The Philosophy of Pseudoscience, Reconsidering the Demarcation Problem, University of Chicago Press, co-edited with Martin Baldry. Other books include Answers for Aristotle, How Science and Philosophy Can Lead Us to a More Meaningful Life, Basic Books, and Nonsense on Stilts, How to Tell Science from Bunk, University of Chicago Press. More information can be found at platofootnote.org. Well, welcome to the show, Mosmo. Are you hearing us? I am hearing you. It was a long introduction. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> Mosmo. I remember your involvement in the University of Tennessee's first Darwin Day back in 1997. Yep. What was your motivation for spearheading that effort? Uh, good question. So I, I was hired, uh, as you might recall, as a young assistant professor in evolutionary biology. And the second semester that I was there, uh, the Tennessee legislature, in its infinite lack of wisdom, uh, tried to pass an anti-evolution law, to be specific, a equal time for creation uh, teaching in high school. And I, you know, I opened the newspaper and I said, uh, what? <laughs> um, and then I, then I pushed everything clicked, right? I said, oh, right, I'm in the middle of the Bible Belt. That's, that's right, Dayton, Tennessee, where the Scopes trial happened. It's only a few miles from here. You know, the, the whole thing just made sense all of a sudden. So what happened was that uh, the effort fortunately didn't go anywhere. The, the bill didn't even get out of committee at the time. Uh, there was a strong response from the university and from other you know, uh, organizations. The BBC actually came on campus to do a, and went to Nashville to do a, a documentary about the, the, the the debacle. Um, so the crisis passed, and then I was having a beer in, uh, in the on the Gain Street uh, Brewery with a couple of colleagues and graduate students at some point, so discussing this whole thing. And we said, well, it would be nice to do something proactive about these sort of things, but instead of waiting for the next crisis to, to take place, which it certainly will. And that's how the idea of Darwin Day started. Uh, we said, okay, maybe once a year we can do a sort of outreach program. Uh, about evolution and the nature of science, the relationship between science and, and religion, and what, what, what should we call it? Well, why don't we call it Darwin Day and doing, doing, doing it on uh, Darwin's birthday? Unbeknownst to us, there were, in fact, another two or three other groups in the country that were doing that, a similar kind of thing, although I don't think anybody was using the precise word, uh, you know, term Darwin Day. So, so we were one of the very first to start this thing. And now, of course, as you know, a uh, number of years later, Darwin Day is an international event with hundreds of events, mostly in the United States, but also in other parts of the, of the world. And so that, that's how it got started. Well, <clears throat> Mosmo, can, can I ask, do you remember this, any specific activities you did on that first Darwin Day? You stand on a hill and announce Darwin Day or <laughs> something perhaps a little more uh, substantive? Well, the, the, the first Darwin Day was sort of uh, organized almost at the last minute because once we had this idea, it, it was already... Um, 
we were into the fall semester and of course that window is usually on or around February 12th so we didn't really have a lot of time to organize anything uh, what we thought we would do uh, is to, to call um, call up some colleagues and, and try to get a high uh, level speaker and we did succeed on that one uh, we had uh, the first hour day speaker was uh, Doug Futuma at Stony Brook University who is the author of uh, one of the very first books on creationism in the, in the United States uh, science on trial and also of a leading textbook in evolutionary biology. And Doug actually uh, eventually then became my colleague at Stony Brook. I was at Stony Brook for five, year, five years after leaving Tennessee. So we got him, and he was gracious enough to accept immediately the invitation and, and to come to campus on, on sort of a short notice. And then we just had um, uh, sort of information tables uh, uh, that were uh, manned by the students uh, throughout the day at the, uh, on campus and for with you know sort of basic information li- literature. Then after that, the following editions became more sophisticated with with uh, workshops for uh, local teachers uh, and with you know a number of activities. Um, but uh, but that was the basic the basic idea. Well, while we don't know the full schedule of activities at the University of Tennessee this year, they will again have Darwin and Wallace puppets. These are like full size things. <laughs> People are inside these things. I, wow! I, I assume you never had anything like that while you were here. No, we did not. We, don't, we were not that sophisticated. Although I have to tell you, I called recently my colleague at uh, at UTK, uh, Sergey Gavilets, who is in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department. He's a mathematical biologist, and I said, Sergey, uh, uh, the the 20th anniversary of Darwin Day at Tennessee is coming up. You know, that's in two, only a couple of years down the road. <laughs> And I said, you know, I really would love to be the speaker for that occasion. So I think he's working on it. So I, I, I hopefully will be back as the, as the 20th year anniversary uh, speaker for that one day. All right. Well, last year I know they made uh, kind of a big effort to bring Wallace into the discussion. Uh-huh. Um, and let, let's assume that we have at least one viewer out there that doesn't know who the, the Wallace reference. Could you, could you summarize that for, for us and our viewers? Sure. So Alfred Wallace was a uh, naturalist, uh, uh, just like uh, Darwin. Uh, he was an independent researcher, just like uh, Darwin. And he came up with the idea of natural selection uh, independently of Darwin. Um, uh, it also, he also came up with that idea in a similar fashion to Darwin. He was uh, traveling in, in to the remote areas of the globe, although different ones from, from the ones that Darwin visited. And at some point, Wallace uh, actually wrote to Darwin, who had been mulling over his notebooks and his, and his ideas for a long time, you know, literally years, and uh, wrote to Darwin and said, you know, what do you think of my, of my idea? And Darwin all of a sudden realized basically that he was about to be scooped. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so he got in a, into a panic, uh, which prompted him, of course, to, to, to publish. So what happened was that uh, he was um, actually very, uh, I think he acted, Darwin acted in a very correct way. He immediately wrote back to Wallace. Uh, saying, you know, I've been working on essentially the same kind of things, and he organized a joint presentation of papers at the Linnean Society in London uh, with the help of, of friends and colleagues. And that's how, in fact, the original, the first publication on, on, evolu- on a theory of evolution is a joint publication, Darwin and Wallace, two papers presented in 1858 at uh, the Linnean Society. Then the following year, Darwin came, up, uh, with, came out with the, the Origin of Species, which most people today remember as the uh, foundational uh, text for, for evolutionary theory. But in fact, the, the origin of species on which Darwin had been working for a long time uh, was prompted by this, this sudden competition from Wallace. So technically, we should really refer to the theory of evolution as the Darwin-Wallace theory of evolution, not, ju- not just the Darwinian theory. Yeah, I, I like to practice amateur astronomy, and in 2009 we had the 400-year anniversary, not of the first not of Galileo being the first to build a telescope, not of Galileo being the first to build a telescope and look at the moon and Venus, but Galileo is the first to build a telescope, look at the moon, look at Venus, look at Jupiter, and then write about it. And it is that writing about it and sharing it with others that, in a sense, is the reason that we should honor someone. Um, right. You know, when 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 people, you know, do these things in secret, um, you know, we, we should think of that, it, it's, you know, it, it, it's a, it, well, it's a lost opportunity, um, and the people who want to somehow champion them is, oh, well, they, 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 they learned all that, but they didn't publish it. Well, we should sort of say, so what? 
then. Yep. Um, I'm specifically thinking of the, the people who, have, who are so enthusiastic about uh, Tesla. Yes, that's right. So, I mean, science, uh, uh, essentially, it's a social activity. And uh, I know that, the, that there is this myth of the, uh, you know, lone genius that does the science and discovers things on, it, on, it, on his own. But in fact, uh, science is a social activity, uh, and it is based not just on discovery, invention, and so on and so forth, but also on peer review and on communication with other people. If it doesn't uh, g uh, come out in public, and if it's not scrutinized by your colleagues in public, uh, then it's really not a contribution. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, you might have a, a claim that sort of historical precedence, but that becomes a footnote. Uh, yeah, footnote is maybe a nice way to mm. think about it, that, oh, here is a guy who, who could have moved the world along if he had merely published earlier. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right. Well, well that's, that's, why, that's why in academia the, 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 uh, they refer to the um, pressure for publishing as the publish or perish uh, uh, situation, right? I mean, if you don't publish, you, you are, in fact, for all effective purposes, dead, at least academically speaking. Yeah. So uh, they're, they're having, uh, you know, puppets this year. I know they must be having teacher workshops, and I guess, uh, Alita, you've, you've attended teacher workshops? I have attended teacher workshops, actually quite a few over the years. Um, but I'd like to talk more about that next week when we have a program about teaching evolution to children. So you'll be back next week. I will. All right. Well, that's great. Um, but Massimo, back in 1997, did you ever envision that Darwin Day would become such a national, even international movement? No, absolutely. Uh, I mean, this, this was just a local thing that we thought, oh, this is a good idea, Let, let's do it, let's get together with initially essentially no budget, eventually it became, you know, uh, it actually relied on, uh, on a constant um, support from the provost of the university and, you know, we were able to get uh, high-profile speakers and all that. But no, I, I certainly didn't think of this as, uh, at all as a, as a national or international thing. Uh, and, but it became that fairly quickly. Uh, I mean, the idea, it'd be probably, uh, you know, it's not like we, we, we can take too much credit for that, for that um, original event, because it probably the idea was in the air. There were, there were a number of people, as I said, that they were thinking about it, one group in California, uh, one in Massachusetts. So it, it, it was bound to happen, apparently, just that the, the cultural climate uh, was ripe for that, and uh, which, which just happened to uh, catch the moment uh, right at the beginning. Uh, so, do you think it's still important to um, continue having these Darwin Day events at institutions of higher learning, or do you think it's it's less important now than it was in those days? No, I think it's it's as important as ever. Uh, the, you know, my my favorite metaphor when we talk about. Uh, uh, sort of pseudoscience or, or, or attacks on science is the one that Carl Sagan famously used in, in one of his books, The, the Demon Hunted World. The subtitle of the book is, is uh, Science as a Candle in the Dark. Uh, science is a candle in the dark, and I would say reason in general is a candle in the dark. It's always under siege. There's always obscurantist forces at, at play. There's always uh, ignorance at play, and so it's a constant struggle. And so it needs to be fought constantly. Every generation has to do it. Uh, sometimes we make progress, sometimes we make significant progress, and other times we just uh, hold on to the territory that we have. Um, so yeah, it needs to be done. In fact, I, I think it, more of these things need to be done. There, there is also, there are equivalents of um, Darwin Day in other academic areas. There is a geologist uh, do a, a similar thing, for instance, the Geological Society of America sponsors a, sing, a similar uh, event uh, in, about the earth sciences. Um, there is also, you know, now that I switched uh, full time to philosophy, we actually do a philosophy day, which is on the third week of November uh, every year, and that's actually sponsored by the UNESCO, by the, the United Nations, mm. uh, you know, cultural uh, organization. So, yeah, all, all, I think that all sorts of academic disciplines uh, have to do this kind of outreach constantly to reaffirm and to explain to the public why they exist, what 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 the issues are, and and why. Uh, certain positions are reasonable and certain others are not that reasonable. Kind of why we do Free Thought Forum TV. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, man, I, I, I can't help but dig into that. So, the third um, week of November. So, well, Darwin Day is, is, is set because of Darwin's birthday. Right. Why the third week in November? Does it commemorate something? No, I, I, as far as I know, it doesn't. I think that, that was just an arbitrary pick by UNESCO. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know why they picked this one, uh, but I've been doing it now for a number of years. And in fact, as it turns out, 
uh, I discovered recently that uh, nobody had been doing it in New York. You know, they, the UNESCO relies on, on local groups and local uh, universities to, to do it, of course. And um, nobody had done it in New York. So the, for the first time, we held it here at City College uh, as a part of the City University of New York. Uh, and it was a, a spectacular success. I mean, to my surprise, you know, we, we again, it's sort of like repeating the history of Darwin Day mm -hmm. in Tennessee. We, we thought about it at the last minute that this is a new position that I'm, that I'm holding here. I, uh, the last semester, the fall semester of last year was my first semester here. And uh, a few weeks into it, we sort of have this idea and we, we found the money. Uh, we got a, a former president of the American Philosophical Association uh, to give the keynote speech, and it was a spectacular success. I mean, students showed up at uh, a number of events that um, uh, that we organized on campus throughout the day. Uh, the uh, evening lecture was uh, standing room only. We have a video now fairly professionally done um, online that is available for everybody to see, and we already have this, the new speaker uh, set for next year is, uh, is going to be uh, Peter Singer, who is a mm. uh, world-renowned, you know, uh, ethicist. So yeah, it's, it's like these things just happen like this. And at <laughs> some point, somebody has an idea, and and somehow things happen. Wonderful. Well, so Masmo, you've been involved with debating people about the merits of evolution and the merits of other views. Yep. Could you share with us and the viewers some of those experiences? Yeah, those were interesting experiences. I mean, most of my debates uh, actually happened during my period in the South. I lived in Tennessee for nine years, and so I, I did debates in Tennessee and Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and you know, a couple of other places. Um, it was mostly, a, I have to say, a southern phenomenon. Uh, <laughs> since I moved back to to, uh, uh, to, to the New York area, it, it just didn't happen. But there's no, not much quality for these kind of things uh, around here. Uh, I do a lot of public lectures and a lot of public discussions, but really not the debates. It was interesting for a number of reasons. First of all, it, it quickly uh, uh, showed me that most scientists, most academics have uh, a fairly wrong-headed idea of a debate. Um, you know, most of my colleagues uh, think that, you know, uh, you, you, you share the stage with, a, let's say, a creationist, and uh, clearly these people are misguided and ignorant and they don't know what they're talking about, so here comes the expert, all you have to do is to explain to them how things are and then everybody will be happy. So it never happens, of course. it never works that way. Uh, I mean, that, that's just an incredibly naive approach to things. Uh, really, the way to think about debates of that kind is not that different from the way in which we we think uh, of debates in, say, politics. You know, think of pres presidential debates. Uh, a presidential debate is not a place where you're going to hear substantive arguments about policy. Uh, what you're going to hear is essentially a sales pitch, uh, which is aimed clearly at not at your at your opponent's uh, supporters because you know you're not going to uh, convince them. It's it's aimed partly to your own uh, supporters so you can get them out for, to vote, and in part, of course, to the to the undecided voters. It's the same with uh, science. Uh, uh, type debates. Uh, you're not going to convince a creationist, certainly not on the spot, uh, about your ideas. What you're doing is you're trying to r rally your own troops to, to, to sort of energize your side to do their own their own thing, their own work. You know, maybe that could be writing letters to the editor or edit or organizing their their own local events, whatever it is. And then you're trying to reach uh, the middle, uh, the middle undecided defense sitters. And that's, I think, by the way, where a lot of uh, my colleagues make a fundamental mistake, because uh, a lot of these debates, and I, I've, I'm sure I've done some of that, especially in, in the early uh, debates as well, as for, for lack, because of lack of experience. But uh, what a lot of people do is they, they get very sarcastic, very snarky, they, <laughs> they get very aggressive. This is not the way to win over the fence sitters. It certainly is a way to work to, to energize your side, but your side, you know, is it, already on your side. Um, if you want to reach the middle ground, the, the fence sitters, you want to come across as a very reasonable guy. Sense of humor is fine. I mean, everybody likes a sense of humor and appreciates a sense of humor. But there's a difference between a sense of humor and sarcasm, okay? Um, so think, if, if, when I think of sense of humor, I think John Stewart. <laughs> and when I think of sarcasm, I think Bill Meyer. I think Bill Meyer is much less effective than John Stewart at what he does, precisely because of that difference. Um, and uh, so one thing you don't want to do is to sort of attack your opponent, you know, uh, head on. Uh, the, the best comments that I got from the other side or from fence seaters after debates 
where along the lines of, well, I'm surprised you were, you looked like a reasonable, nice guy. <laughs> that's 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 what you, that's what you're aiming for, really. Okay, I, all right, I follow. Um, certainly, the first time or two you did this, I, you you must have been then kind of surprised, you know, maybe surprised at the the lack of sophistication of the arguments of the opponents, and maybe they were mostly emotional appeals, or anything stick out or that you no, know about that? No, actually, uh, the, if there is anything that surprises you when you start doing these debates, is, the, uh, is exactly the sophistication of your opponents. Uh, you know, in fact, one, another common mistake uh, made by, by a number of scientists is to go in assuming that these people are going to just make an emotional appeal to emotion and they, they really don't know what they're talking about. They do. They, they've done a lot of research. Now, of course, they get it very wrong and they, they interpret it very wrong and they present it very wrong. But they know a lot of details and they try to catch you off, off guard uh, so that if you're not prepared, not just about your own uh, you know, turf. You know, you obviously, if you want to debate evolution, you better know some a lot about evolutionary biology. Or if you want to debate climate science, you better know something about climate science. But uh, it's not just that. You really need to know also the way these people think and their kind of arguments. For uh, let me give you an example. One of I, I did five debates over a number of years with Duane Gish, who at the time was the vice president of the Institute for Creation Research, and uh, Gish. Uh, likes to, to throw these really obscure references to, to, to his opponent, uh, that if you don't know what you're talking about, you sort of like, you scratch your head, which is the worst thing you can do in a public arena, right? Because they, they, then the public thinks, ah, gotcha. And for instance, he did one of them to, to me, and he says, so, if evolution is true, how do you explain granite? You know, the, the rocks. Like, like, and your first reaction is like, what the hell is that going to do with anything? <laughs> Uh, but I knew where he was coming uh, from because I didn't, my, 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 my background work, so he was connecting in a very bizarre way, so his notions of flood geology uh, with, with the notion of, of sort of creation science. And so I responded, you know, as best as I could, but, but I showed at least that I did my homework and I knew what he was talking about and I had a counter argument on his own terms. Uh, that's, that's really a mistake sort of to underestimate your opponent in these debates. These people are not stupid, and they, and they know quite a bit about biology, geology, or science. They just interpret it completely wrong, but, but that's different. All right. Um, uh, when, when I, I guess when I was thinking about, um, uh, well, maybe naive arguments, it, it occurred to me that I was thinking almost anyone who is going to try and support a young Earth uh, creationist argument it, it feels that anything they might say to me would would be so very naive. And now, is is Gish um, is is Gish a young Earth creationist? Yeah, he's a yak. He's a young Earth creationist. Yeah, my um, goodness. Yes, I know, right? And uh, in fact, there is a geologist there uh, near uh, where you guys are at uh, at Bryan College, which is of course in in uh, uh, the Dayton, Tennessee, where where you know the Dayton, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Sorry, where the um, the scope trial took place, and the guy is a is a geologist. I forgot his name, but the guy is a geologist. He's, he has a PhD in geology from Harvard, which ironically he got from Stephen Jay Gould, one of the most prominent evolutionary biologists of the, the latter part of the 20th century. And Gould knew that the, this guy was a creationist, and uh, he accepted it anyway in, uh, in in his lab. And he said, you know, Gould, Gould's. Uh, reasoning was, you know, if the guy writes a thesis that is publishable and reaches the the, the standards of um, uh, an acceptable piece of technical work, then he deserves his PhD. I actually disagree with that take. Um, I think that a PhD is not just about uh, producing a uh, acceptable type of technical work. It's also about understanding the basics and and, and of, of an entire field of scientific research. And clearly, this guy didn't understand it because otherwise he wouldn't be a creationist, uh, a younger creationist. So, uh, so I actually would not have given uh, th that person a PhD under my in, in my lab. Uh, but nonetheless, the guy has <laughs> credentials, you know, from Harvard. He doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I see we're at the halfway point. So, if we could ask Mosmo to hang on, um, we can maybe uh, jump to our mid-program break and remind viewers. Uh, about the people, the organizations that sponsor this program. 
Am I host one? You can be host one. All right. In case you're just turning, tuning in, this is Free Thought Forum, a program by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. Free Thought Forum is funded jointly by them and by individual contributions. Shows are live most every Tuesday from 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern on Knoxville Community Access Television Channel 12 or Channel 194, depending on your local cable network. Tell your out-of-town friends to see us streaming online at ctvnox.org. This is a call-in show, and we are live today, February 3rd, 2015. Viewers can call in now to the number on the screen with short comments or questions, and we'll let Mosmo try to field them first, and Alita and I will maybe uh, talk a little bit if we've got something to say as well. Sam, are you ready with the videos? Yeah. And are questioning well, your religious beliefs or simply believe in one less God okay. than everyone else? So. Well, you're not alone. The Atheist Society of Knoxville is a fun and friendly group of people just like you that meets twice a week at a bar or restaurant. We meet every Tuesday night following the show at Barley's Tap Room and Pizzeria for happy hour. You'll find our group either inside or on the patio. Look for Richard Dawkins' silver jacketed book, The God Delusion, standing upright on the table. On Fridays, we meet at Agave Azul or the Beard and Beer Market. But if you plan to preach, proselytize, provoke, or punch, please don't. We all question what we believe at one point in our lives. If this is the time for you, come join us for food, drink, conversation, and fun. Do you find stories of talking snakes laughable? Do you prefer the scientific method over supernatural beliefs? Are you concerned about religious leaders and organizations imposing their values and rules on your body, your family, and the rest of our society? Well, take comfort in the fact that you're not alone. The Rationalists of East Tennessee meets weekly for fellowship and provides a forum for people who support skeptical thinking and rational discussion of these and other issues. To find out more information or to find out about our next meeting, visit us on the web at www.rationalist.org. If you live in the Atheist Society of Knoxville, or ASK, meets two times a week. We have evening meetups for fun, food, drink, and conversation. ASK's purpose is to supply a venue for community, camaraderie, and outreach to atheists, agnostics, freethinkers, and other like minded persons in the East Tennessee area. Our Tuesday meeting is going on now at the Barley's Tap Room and Pizzeria in the Knoxville Old City. The Rationalists of East Tennessee has Sunday activities involving lively presentations and discussions on subjects topical and timeless. Once a month we get together for Book Club. The title of the February book is An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth by Chris Hadfield. So this is Sunday, February 8th at 2 p.m at, it's actually at Books a Million. This is a new location. You need not have read the book to attend, but of course it helps. Visit our website, rationalists.org, to find the rest of the calendar of books and join us at the new location, Books a Million, 8513 Kingston Pike, Knoxville, every Sunday at 2 p.m. Every second Sunday of the month. Second Sunday of the month, yeah. <laughs> Um, both the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee help provide a social outlet where you will find that if you don't believe in Zeus, Zoroaster, or Yahweh, you, you are, are not, not alone. alone. All right. Well, um, for viewers who may have tuned in during our video break, we have a call-in interview with Mosmo. Mosmo, I'm, I will mangle your last name if I attempt <laughs> to pronounce it. Help us with your, your last name, please. Filucci, an evolutionary biologist and philosopher. And I'd really like to encourage callers um, you know, who are watching the program, call on the number on your show and give us some questions about um, evolution, the teaching of evolution, and perhaps philosophy. Or if you want to know more about Darwin Day. Or Darwin Day, all right. Well, let's see. Uh, trying to get back to where we were in the show notes, I think I was going to ask. Mm -hmm. Masmo, could you help us understand the difficulties of defining species? And in particular, I just love the concept of ring species as how it maybe gives some insights into speciesization. And the, uh, 
I, I've not had a chance to talk with you on this directly because the last time I talked with you on a subject like this, we were still meeting in the candy factory. <laughs> um, so, yeah, species is an interesting uh, issue in biology. Um, there is quite a bit of controversy still about how to best define species. And in fact, I think that it's best not to define species, frankly, if you ask me. Um, so starting with Darwin, uh, Darwin did not believe in the, in the existence of species, in the objective existence of species, which is kind of ironic for somebody who wrote a book called On the Origin of Species, right? <laughs> um, but basically, he took evolution to be a gradual process over a long period of time, which means that, that there are no fixed boundaries to any uh, group of organisms. And so species are just a, a convenient categorization for human beings to sort of to see, uh, find our way through the natural world, but they don't really exist, meaning that there is no uh, circumscribed and, and completely self-contained group of, of organisms of a certain type as opposed to another. It's all a flux in time, according to Darwin. Now, this is not the dominant view today. Uh, the, I, I would guess that the dominant view among biologists is something along the lines of what is called, a bit redundantly in my mind, the biological species concept, uh, as opposed to what? This, 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 since, since species are biological entities, clearly it must be biological. Um, but the biological species concept essentially says that organisms belong to the same species uh, if they can actually or potentially uh, interbreed and produce, uh, you know, uh, uh, produce fertile offspring. Now, it's as far as that goes, it's okay. It's, it, it works okay, except that there are there's an, a large number of well-known exceptions. Um, you know, that concept of the, the biological species concept works particularly well for mammals and most vertebrates, uh, but it begins to break down with some insects, and it completely breaks down for plants, fungi. Uh, and a lot of unicellular organisms, especially bacteria. Uh, you know, bacteria, for one thing, don't have sex. They have a very special kind of quote-unquote sex, but they don't actually interbreed in, in anything like the way in which uh, vertebrates do. Uh, plants interbreed all over the place. I mean, there are uh, very well-documented cases um, in, uh, in, the, uh, in plant science where uh, plants that reasonably can be considered to belong to different species actually produce fertile offspring. Uh, you know, think just, just think of uh, orchids, for instance, you know, that the entire uh, industry of producing orchids is based on, on interspecific hybrids. Uh, now, so, so the idea is that if that's the case, then the so-called biological species concept actually applies to only a, uh, a, a certain subgroup of living organisms, not applicable uh, universally. So I published actually a paper a number of years ago where in, in the journal Bioessays, where I suggested that species are really what uh, in philosophy of science are called uh, cluster concepts. Uh, a cluster concept, uh, uh, the best way I can explain it to you is, is to uh, give you an example that has nothing to do with biology. So if I were to ask you, um, you know, give me a definition of the concept of game and, you know, as things that you play with, uh, activities, you know, play activities. Uh, it seems like it's simple, right? It seems like, like, well, we should be able to do that. I mean, we all know what a game is. But in fact, it's actually fairly dif difficult because you start listing a series of criteria, uh, like, for instance, you know, there's rules. Well, yeah, but there's all sorts of activities that, are, that have rules and they're not games. Um, uh, well, it's done for competition. Well, not necessarily because there are some games like Solitaire where there is no competition. Uh, it's done for fun. Well, not necessarily because there are some games that are played very seriously on you know, a professional level and so on and so forth. So um, once you get to the bottom of this list, you, you realize that what you've done is to list a number of criteria, none of which are either necessary or necessarily sufficient uh, to define a game. So does that mean that we don't know what a game is? Of course we do. Uh, but it's a family resemblance. It's a cluster concept, meaning that there's a bunch of these little threads that intersect and they have something to do with the concept of game, but by themselves don't define it. There is always exceptions. There is always games that don't fit into the general definition. There is always borderline cases and so on and so forth. I think that the, the, the species concept is a similar issue. Um, certain threads, certain, certain aspects, aspects of it, like, for instance, interbreeding, the ability to interbreed and, and, and produce fertile offspring, is certainly one of those threads, and it does work well to define, to, to, to uh, outline certain groups of organisms, but it doesn't work well for others. 
In other cases, there are other criteria that are, that are equally or even more important. Uh, for instance, ecological differentiation. Uh, I mentioned the species of orchids uh, that interbreed. Well, if they interbreed, how do we know that they're different species? Well, because in nature we find them in very different places. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we never, they never overlap ecologically. They, they, they do their own thing. So, so that I think is the best way to think about species as a uh, cluster concept, as a, as a concept that does not actually uh, in, um, admit of a simple definition in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions. Uh, which doesn't mean that it's a useless concept. It doesn't mean that we don't know what we're talking about. It just means that it's an inherently fuzzy concept. As you were describing that, I remembered uh, an argument Richard Dawkins made in, I believe, The Ancestor's Tale. Now, he was talking about genera, which is the, the next higher group above species. Right. Um, and he said even a small child will look at tigers and lions and say, kitty, where, right. you know, a small child has not been taught to think rigorously, and yet, you know, they see a resemblance, and they label it with something that's obvious to us that, Correct. yeah, there's there's a validity to that. Um, right. And although, if you ask the same child what a seahorse is, it will probably <laughs> not say fish. <laughs> right. I mean, that's that's the problem. Yes. I mean, Dawkins, of course, is right that we do develop intuitions. Yeah. about based on similarity between organisms but sometimes there are exceptions and and we know for instance that that seahorses are fish uh you know they're genetically so they're they're phylogenetically so they're they're derived from other fish species but they don't look like fish <laughs> it's, it's a very different looking kind of beast. <laughs> um all right Massimo. um in recent years you've shifted your focus to philosophy in the, in the most recent issue of the Skeptical Inquiry, you stated, and I quote, skeptics need to be just as conversant in the basics of philosophy, particularly philosophy of science, epistemology, and logic, as they need to be about the basics of science, end quote. Could you yep. tell us more about that? Yeah, so I've noticed a disturbing trend in the skeptical and even the atheist movement, actually, over the last few years, uh, which is a movement away from philosophy and, and toward an uh, almost uncritical embracing of science, uh, something that is actually refer often referred to as scientism. The, the uncritical embracing uh, of, of, of science is, is, uh, has this, uh, is usually termed scientism, um, which is very different from what atheism and skepticism used to be uh, not, not that long ago. I mean, if you think of the, the sort of the classic skeptics in the classic 80s, you know, Bertrand Russell, Carl Sagan, people like that, um, those people were very conversant uh, in philosophy. Bertrand mm -hmm. Russell obviously was a philosopher. But even uh, Carl Sagan, uh, you know, if you, if you go through several of these books, uh, the philosophy and the, sci and the science are completely intermingled, and he they, they draws from, from both of them. And he doesn't shy away uh, from criticizing uh, the science where it, where it needs to be criticized. Um, so I noticed, however, that especially since the onset of the new atheism, um, there's been, uh, in fact, I've written a couple of technical papers other than the uh, article uh, about this, other than the article in Skeptical Inquiry that you mentioned. Uh, I, so I noticed this, this embracing uh, of science and, and sort of disdain for philosophy, mm -hmm. which I think it's not helped by a, a number of highly... Uh, you know, visible figures in the skeptic movement, you know, scientists essentially, and I'm talking. You know, I'm going to name names because uh, this, this is this is definitely. It's on, I'm on the record already. So Lawrence Krauss, for instance, who is a cosmology cosmologist, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, who is of course the director of the Planetarium uh, here in New York uh, at the American Museum of Natural History, and I know both of them. I've had both of them on my podcast, you know, the Russian Speaking Podcast. Uh, I mean, on good terms with both of them, but boy. They really say things about philosophy that absolutely don't make sense, and they can they demonstrate to me very clearly that never read a philosophy book or an article, you know, a paper in philosophy, a technical paper in philosophy, and yet they feel like they can pontificate and dismiss an entire field that they clearly do not understand. Um, I take that to be a uh, essentially anti-intellectual attitude, which is kind of ironic from uh, from the, the point of view of uh, intellectuals, you know, academics. And of course, from the point of view of a movement that it prides itself in the, in the use of reason, so I think that we need to to correct this. And uh, and now I know I think I know what it's coming from. I mean, there's there's some good there's some good sociological and historical reason for this kind of uh, change. And I suspect uh, that the the turn against philosophy 
uh, by scientists and, and, um, and uh, by skeptics uh, goes back to the 1990s and uh, in particular to what is referred to as the science wars. The science wars were this period of about a decade or so when a number of, of postmodernist philosophers uh, attacked science, uh, uh, making arguments along the lines of, you know, science is just another uh, cultural activity, it's just another cultural norm, it doesn't have any more claim to truth than, you know, anything else, including, for instance, creationism. Now, those, those uh, critiques, those, those uh, writings were, in fact, silly and deserve to be criticized and, you know, booted out uh, because they were absolutely insane. Uh, but what seems to have been lost in, this, in, the, in the midst of all this noise is the fact that postmodernism has always been a very small part of philosophy, and that actually mo- most of the good arguments, the best arguments against postmodernist philosophy were made by other philosophers, uh, mm-hmm. particularly by philosophers of science, who have always been staunch defenders of science and allied of the skeptical movement. So I think that there's been a lot of confusion there where, if you know, if you talk to people like Krauss and, and, and Tyson, they really seem to equate philosophy with postmodernism, which is bizarre. It's, it, it would be like equating science with eugenics. You know, it's it's like, taking no. a, a small <laughs> you know, slice of it, yeah. Well, yeah, you know, it just if, doesn't work that way. If I had one or both of them here and you here, I think I would try to reconcile you all by asking some maybe something like the following questions. And I would, I would begin it by, by pointing out a kind of a mistake that happened in science for a long time, and that was that Aristotle said that, well, the heavens must be perfect, and the only perfect motion that could go on indefinitely has to be circular, and therefore the earth must be at the center and the heavens turn circularly around us. And for right. 2,000 years that stopped progress. I could suspect that they may be thinking of that as an example of philosophy. And, and that when, when you then go further and say, well, let's now choose that which is true, or let's, just, let, let's try and set up some way to determine that which is true by, by questioning nature using an experiment, now you've become science. Yeah. And I would wonder if, if we ask those two if that's what they mean by philosophy versus science, if we could then develop a better vocabulary between us and then maybe not argue about this, find common ground. Um, perhaps. I mean, I, I like your, your optimism. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, but, but I actually, I have talked to both of them, as I said, for, to, to, to quite a, uh, uh, an extent. And it seems to me that, that really they just don't know what they're talking about, literally, in that particular field. Uh, they they um, just do not are not familiar with the philosophical literature, which there is no reason why they should be. You know, they're they're professional scientists, and there is quite enough professional scientific literature to keep up with. It's difficult enough to be a specialist in one field, let alone in two, three, or four. So it's there's no reason why they should be familiar with the philosophical literature, except of course when they go out and talk about mm-hmm. it, as if they were in fact experts. Um, you know, that, the example that you brought up, for instance, is interesting. So, uh, first of all, Aristotle was actually just as much a scientist as he was a, um, uh, a philosopher. And, you know, he did field work on the island, uh, on the island of Lesbo, for instance, uh, looking at uh, shell shapes and, and, and doing sort of anatomy. In, of, of in the vertebrae. biological sciences is where That's he, right, he did his, biological his field work. Uh, but he also did physics, as you mentioned. Yeah, of course he was wrong with physics. So was Newton. <laughs> so, you know, uh, it, it, that, that's the thing about science. You know, every generation shows how the previous generation turned out to be wrong. Um, I, I, it wasn't, I, I, I've got a quibble on that. Yeah. The word incomplete is the one I prefer. I, I'm, I'm quoting Feynman on that. You know, he likes to say that we know that, that what we know is incomplete. To say wrong, you know, when, when we... If we think once upon a time that lots of people thought the world was flat, whether that, that's true or not, when right. we then say the world is round, and then if we then think it's, well, it's a perfect sphere, uh, well, then we're wrong too, because, well, there are mountains. All right, well, now we say there's mountains. Well, and then right. eventually we learn about the equatorial bulge. Mm-hmm. All of these right. are improvements. Yeah, so. well, with, yes, I'm going to quibble on your quibble, if you don't mind. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I mean, with all due respect to Feynman, uh, uh, yes, of course, in a lot of cases, well, I don't know about a lot of cases, but in a good number of cases, certainly one can see changes in scientific theories as progress. I mean, nobody's denying, well, at least I am not denying, that science makes progress, and therefore, in some sense, 
uh, the previous theory was incomplete and it's been you know improved by by the following theory for sure that's that's true but there's also a fairly large number and significant number of cases where scientists were simply downright wrong I mean if you go from the Ptolemaic system of you know the earth is the center of the universe to the Copernican system where the sun is the center of the solar system well Ptolemy was just wrong it wasn't an improvement it was just it was wrong, period. Uh, the, the new system is completely different, it's sort of quite totally different from the old one. Now, Newton is an interesting example. So uh, you often hear this idea that, well, the general theory of relativity, which is essentially what, it, what has uh, uh, substituted for, you know, uh, for Newtonian mechanics, uh, that the general theory of relativity is an expansion of it, and the Newtonian mechanics is actually a, a specific uh, subcase, you know, limit case of general relativity. This is true in one sense, and it's definitely not true and, and fairly misleading in another sense. What is true is that Newtonian, uh, the Newtonian equations, you know, the, the, the mathematical structure of Newtonian mechanics can in fact be derived as a special case, as a limit case of the general the field equations in general relativity. That is true. So in that sense, you can say, see, uh, general relativity is an improvement uh, and not as a replacement of Newtonian mechanics, which is sort of generalized, uh, as the name implies, you know, general relativity, um, as, uh, the, the, the Newtonian insight. That's true on one hand, but, uh, but the concept of space-time that Newton had is radically and qualitatively different from the concept of space-time that Einstein introduced. For Newton, space and time were fixed entities and we're independent of each other. For Newton, uh, sorry, for Einstein, space-time are two aspects of the same thing, and they are actually malleable. They, are, you know, they, they change, they are, they're altered by gravitational forces, by the presence of, of uh, and, and by speed. So in that sense, you can say that Newtonian mechanics was in fact qualitatively different from, from uh, uh, general relativity, and that therefore Newton was in, in important senses wrong. Now, there's nothing strange about this. Science makes progress either by improving on previous theories or sometimes just by replacing them. And in fact, I think it's a virtue of science to uh, acknowledge that that's the way you make progress. You, you, you look at certain ideas and you say, you know what, we were wrong there. Or, you know what, we were sort of very vaguely close to it, but now we know much better. Um, this is the strength of science. There is no shame in, 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 in it. And the history of science clearly bears out this, this kind of picture that sometimes it's a, an improvement, sometimes it's just a replacement. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm impressed. I'm wondering if you picked that example. Uh, it, it, so, the, the, the example I used of, that Feynman, sorry, that Feynman was talking about, you know, uh, I improving uh, knowledge. And he actually used special relativity, not general relativity, to illustrate uh -huh. that very same point. Right. Uh, I'm impressed that you essentially did the same thing. You took Newton <laughs> and then went to one of the relativities. Right, right. <laughs> All right. Well, Feynman, so Feynman is an interesting uh, character. Of course, he was a brilliant scientist, right? arguably one of the, the, the most uh, uh, interesting scientists of the, the, the 20th century, right? But he also did not have a particularly good uh, impression of philosophy. So even <laughs> though, in fact, a number of his books can be interpreted as philosophizing, uh, you know, as you know, uh, most of Feynman's books were actually published after he died, uh, and they were not actually meant as books originally. They were, you know, lecture notes and things like that. But uh, um, there's one that has the word, I forgot the exact title, but it has citizen in, uh, in the title, which is a collection of essays. And those essays are, by all, all accounts, philosophical essays. They're, they are uh, essays about philosophy of science or science and society. Uh, but sci but, but uh, Feynman is, is uh, often quoted by physicists today um, as saying that, uh, you know, philosophy is as relevant to science as ornithology is relevant to birds, which is a very clever quip, of course, uh, until you start sort of deconstructing it a little bit. Um, at which point you realize, for instance, that ornithology is very, very important to birds because a lot of bird species wouldn't be alive today if there were no ornithologists studying them. Uh, that's the charitable way of putting it. The other way to, uh, uh, is to remind people that uh, the reason ornithology is relevant to birds is because birds are too stupid to understand ornithology. They can't do ornithology. So, you know, when you, you've got to be careful when you make that kind of, you know, funny uh, uh, comments about an entire other field because the other guy can pissed off and come back and bite you in the, in the arse. <laughs> well, I, I, I learned what little I've learned about the ancient philosophers from reading Isaac Asimov, and I know that Neil Tyson 
Um, uh, I think annually he hosts some kind of an Isaac Asimov uh, honorary lecture. So it has me wondering yeah. if he's read many of the things that are frankly quite critical of Aristotelian ideas because often Asimov will attribute Aristotle as having done such a great job of summarizing science that he then fossilized it um, right. for, for, you know, well, two th nearly 2,000 years. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's, it's funny, however, that people blame Aristotle for it. Uh, I mean, we really should blame the scholastics. Uh, the scholastic philosophers, which of course were church philosophers throughout the Middle Ages, you know, those, those are the ones that took Aristotle at, as, uh, uh, as an oracle and uh, so sort of resisted any improvement on it un, uh, until, of course, people like Copernicus and Galileo and Kepler showed up and, and, and incidentally Descartes. Uh, you know, Rene Descartes, of course, is, is remembered today as a philosopher, right, largely, right? but he thought of himself as a scientist. Of course, at the time, the word didn't exist. But he thought of himself as a natural philosopher. He actually uh, wrote a lot of treatises on, in, on optics, for instance, and, uh, and uh, other uh, areas of physics. And um, Descartes was one of, you know, he was a contemporary of Galileo, and uh, he was one of those people who pushed the, the, the idea of the Copernican system and all that. So it's interesting that uh, that we blame Aristotle for it. I mean, the guy just didn't, never meant for him for, him, for himself to be a, an oracle. It's just that other people took it that way. And you're right, that did slow down process, uh, progress probably for literally centuries. Well, Massimo, we need to interrupt right now and say we have about two minutes left before we need to do our closing thing. So, yes. Do you have any last words for our television audience you'd like them to remember you by in two minutes? Oh my gosh, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, things you wish we had asked you. What do you wish we'd asked you that we haven't gotten to? Oh, I wish you had asked me about my uh, my new venture, which is the the Scantia Salon uh, uh, magazine, online magazine. Uh, so the, I, I've, I'm putting a lot of energy and, and time into this thing, and I think it's coming out pretty pretty nicely. It is a, a magazine uh, magazine that is. Uh, the purpose of which is to bring the ivory tower to Main Street and vice versa, as we say in the tagline. And so this, the, the idea is to offer a forum to academics in all sorts of areas. The word scientia is uh, Latin from, uh, that means knowledge in the, in the broadest possible sense. So it includes philosophy, mathematics, logic, uh, science, uh, history, and so on and so forth. And uh, the, the idea is to bring uh, people who, who are doing research and scholarship in those areas uh, to write for the general public without having to concern themselves with actually maintaining a blog or or, 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 man, or cultivating social networks and all that. I do that for them. Uh, but they send me their essays written for the general public, and then I, I edit them, publish them, and then we've developed that this has been going on for almost a year now, and we've developed a, a really sophisticated audience. There's lots of interesting discussions going on uh, in depth. The others are uh, are encouraged, if not if not quite required to engage uh, with their readers for a period of five days. I mean, I, I put a window of sure. time. Because About 15 seconds now. <laughs> 15 yeah. seconds. So give the year so, so that's it. I'll, I'll encourage people to go and check out scientiasalon.org and, okay. and have a different experience from your regular blog. Okay, thank you, Massimo, for joining us this evening. It, it was um, a lot of fun, and I read the column you had in yesterday's New York Times, so maybe um, later on we can interview you about stoicism. It, it will be a pleasure. All right, Thanks and on, on next week's show, we'll be continuing with the theme of Darwin Day. We'll talk about teaching evolution to young children, sharing with them Darwin's grand view expressed at the end of On the Origin of Species, where he was saying, Whilst this planet has gone circling on according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. In case you're just tuning in, this is Free Thought Forum, a program by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. Free Thought Forum is funded jointly by them and by individual contributions. Shows are live most Tuesdays, 5 to 6 p.m. You can see us streaming on live at ctvknox.org. <laughs> <laughs> we would like to thank our viewers and send our thanks to Sam and Jonas for technical support.